This is the lady from Blondie Hacks, and what I have for you today is a federal B21 indicator. Nothing on one, slight click on two, solid click on three. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to show you how to repair and fix up old dial indicators. You don't have to be intimidated by these things. You, yes you, there in the shirt, you can fix these things. And I'm going to show you how right now. I acquired this Federal B21 tenths indicator off eBay. It's listed in non-working condition. The mechanism is very, very sticky and the bezel is completely seized and the bezel is almost opaque. You can't hardly see through it. Let's see if we can breathe new life into it. Now this is not my first rodeo restoring indicators. A few years ago I bought this thing on eBay. It was listed as a fixture for balancing hard drive platters for IBM 3330 disc packs. I don't know if that's what it actually is, but really it's just three sterret indicators arranged in a triangle and all three of them were seized up. So I want to show you that most of the time these things are actually pretty easy to get going again. I'll start by removing the back. Really you just need some pretty basic tools to work on indicators some screwdrivers, some picks, things like that. Now there are some more difficult repairs that I'll get into in a minute that do require specialist tools, particularly watchmakers tools, but I'll show you what we can do right up to that point. Don't assume all the screws in a given assembly are the same length, so you always want to check them. If they're not, then you got to make sure they go back in the same place as they came out because you might interfere with some other part of the mechanism then. So the back is kind of wedged on there. Razor blade will pop it free. And let's get a look at the mechanism. Now, don't be afraid. What you're going to see in here looks very much like the inside of a pocket watch, but it's actually much, much simpler than a pocket watch, so no need to be intimidated here. This top frame here, or bridge as I believe it's properly called in pocket watch terminology, is removed with three screws. Now, I'm sure I'm going to anger and enrage all of the watchmakers and clockmakers out there, so bear with me as I fumble my way through this. And you want to work on a soft surface to keep things from rolling around and to protect the bezel from being scratched and things like that. Now that bridge lifts off and that's holding three axles that you can see there. You can see the backs of three bearings. When I flip this over, now it really looks like a watch because you can see that those bearings are in fact little pieces of ruby. And in fact, they're properly called jewels, I believe, not bearings in the watchmaker trade, but bearings is what they are. Now inside here you'll see gears, which are again called wheels in clockmaker terminology, and you'll see a hairspring there, and you'll also see a rack and pinion mechanism there, and that's what activates the clockwork mechanism. So when you push that plunger in, it's just spinning that gear train, and then the two hands on the indicator, the minute hand and the second hand, if you will, simply move in a ratio to each other to measure the distance of travel. This little post here rides in a slot on the underside of the bridge to keep the indicator arm from rotating. Now I want to get that indicator arm out of the way because it's keeping me from getting any of the wheels out. So I'm actually going to put that bridge back in place because that will keep the indicator arm from rotating and so I can unthread the components of it. So the tip comes out easily enough. Now I wasn't sure which end of the enclosure barrel there might untwist. One of them will. Turns out it's the back. Now nothing should be very tight here, so don't force anything or start putting pliers on things, of course. Just be patient and it will reveal its secrets. In this case, the plunger has a screw in the end of it that is clearly retaining the mechanism. So out comes that guy. And now I can pull this bridge off once again and get back to business. The anti-rotation post is also holding the retraction spring. There's actually two springs that pull the indicator back. There's this one large one here on the post, and then there's the main spring on the clockwork mechanism. So with that spring disconnected, now I can slide the plunger all the way out, except that that arm is going to be in the way, so that's gotta come off. Now this thing was actually very tight. This is unusual for parts this small to be this tight. I gave it a quick try with some needle nose. That wasn't going to work. I didn't want to round it over. I don't have a wrench that small, so I put parallel jaw pliers on it. Even though these pliers are comically oversized, they're still parallel jaw, so they're not going to round anything over or strip any threads if you're careful. I'll fish that spring out of there. And now I can rotate the plunger so that the rack is clear of the pinion there that drives the mechanism, and I can slide that out of there. Uh, it looks like it's in good condition. It's good to clean those up because those are often gummed up with varnish and shop crud. It's often what makes an indicator stick. Now I can start pulling out the wheels. So there's the initial pinion there that runs on the rack. 
and then there's an idler that drives the central needle or the second hand if you will and then the higher range minute hand is an additional wheel off of that central pinion now this guy has the mainspring on it and I'm going to leave that in place because pulling that out is going to make things go sproying and there's really no need for it and it seems to have nothing wrong with it so leave well enough alone. There's a small secondary bridge here that supports the back of the central needle pinion there. And I briefly looked at removing that, but it's also being held from the other side, which requires removing the dial face to access those other screws. So I'm gonna leave that in place for now. Once again, I'm not disassembling any further than necessary here to diagnose and fix the issues this indicator has, because very quickly you get into needing specialty watchmaker tools here. Case in point, I took the screws out of the lower bridge and attempted to lift the entire mechanism out to access some of those other parts, but it's being held on by the needles on the other side, and removing those needles does require specialty watchmaker tools, so I'm not going to mess with that. But let's get into the other side. So we need to take the bezel off, and it's seized up, as you can see there. It should be spinning, but it doesn't. Now there's a couple of retainer screws here, so I will remove these. They're full of crud, and so I'm going to clean those out with a pick first with these little tiny screws, you really wanna make sure the slots are clean, otherwise it's very, very easy to strip them out, and then you're really in trouble. Once those are out, then it'll pull right off. You can see there's an O-ring in there that gives it the friction and seals up the gauge there from shop crud. So now we get a look at the dial, and it looks to be in excellent shape actually, which is good. And then the bezel has the number ring in it that turns with that so that you can zero it wherever you like. So I'll put that back down under there just to protect the needles while we finish our work here. I'm going to screw that lower bridge back down, but we'll come back to that because it actually serves a purpose that I'm skipping over here for now. So I'm going to oil the jewels here, and there's lots of fancy clockmaker oils you can use, and people on the internet love to argue about oil for any type of machinery, but I'm using a basic light machine oil here. So I'm going to put a little drop on the underside of the wheels that I can't remove. For the jewels that I can reach, I'm using alcohol on a wooden toothpick just to clean any grit, crud, etc. out of there. Absorb any excess there, and then give that a minute to dry. I'm also cleaning the ends of the axles there in the alcohol as well. Then a drop of oil in the center of each jewel. You just kind of want to see a meniscus of oil across the gap. Really a, like a single drop is all these need. Any more than that is just going to collect dirt and make a mess in there. And of course you don't want it to be running dry either. So it really doesn't need much. And then I can reinsert the idler wheel there. And the drive pinion wheel goes back in on top of that. You can see there really isn't much to these. Mechanism wise, these are about a third of a pocket watch. There's a minute hand and an hour hand, if you will, but there's no escapement and there's no winding mechanism and there's, you know, all the other fiddly bits that go with an actual pocket watch. And then for the other bridge, I do the same thing. I clean out the jewels with a little bit of alcohol and a wood toothpick, mop up the excess, and then set that aside to evaporate thoroughly. And meanwhile, I'm going to use a Q-tip to clean out the bushings that the plunger runs in. Those always accumulate crud, and a sticking indicator is almost certainly due to this area here. And then the plunger itself is cleaned and oiled, especially on the rack there that interfaces with the pinion. Make sure everything's got a nice thin coat. Again, you know, less is better than more. You really don't need a whole lot of lubricant here. The anti-rotation post goes back on, and then I fish that spring back on there. And this spring here is a very common cause of indicators that don't retract properly. These springs break or slip off, and then you're left with just the mainspring on the movement to retract the plunger, which is really not enough. So if you've got an indicator that won't retract, but it doesn't seem sticky, it's probably this spring. And once again, a drop of oil on the jewels in the upper frame, and we can reinstall this. As with any other mechanism when reinstalling the screws, you kind of want to go in a crosshatch pattern, tighten things evenly, and with these little screws, remember they really don't need to be very tight at all. Now after that basic clean and lube, that may fix it, but in this case you can see that the plunger is still sticky, and that's because the backlash on the pinion isn't correct. Most of the mechanism is fixed in place with regard to the wheels and how they relate to each other, but the pinion on the main plunger does have a backlash setting. So rotating that frame adjusts the backlash between the rack and the pinion and allows you to get the needle moving freely. But now you may notice that the needles are in the wrong place. 
That's okay, we can easily fix that. So remove that bridge again. The first thing to fix is the timing of the needles to the plunger. So to do that, just remove the idler gear. And you can rotate the needles until they both land at zero. If you need to adjust the timing of the needles to each other, then that requires separating the two gears in there that I did not take out, but that's rare. So put that idler back in and now the zero is in the right place and we're good to go. Let's look at that bezel now. These are frequently scratched up and cloudy because they're plastic. So an alcohol wipe just to clean the worst of the bird poop off. And if that's not enough, then it's time to get serious. So I start with Novus number two, which is a scratch remover for plastics. It's a very, very fine abrasive, followed by Novus number one, which is a cleaner for plastics. These are products from the pinball world and they work great on any kind of clear plastic like this. Apply some of this liberally and rub it in circles until your hand gets tired and then maybe do it again. You pretty much can't do too much of this stuff. It's such a fine abrasive that basically the more you do it, the better the plastic looks. You really can't hurt anything with this stuff. And then once that's looking nice and optically clear, then finish up with the Novus number one and give it a nice polish and a buff. I'm using all uh, lint-free cloths here. There, look how nice and clear that is, especially compared to what it was. Novus is great stuff for old uh, car headlights too, by the way. Now that bezel is supposed to rotate, but was seized. So I'll pull the O-ring off. These things are frequently perished, as is this one. You can see that it was actually pinched there as well. So I'll pull that off and clean out the slot with some alcohol and a Q-tip there. Get all the old bits of rubber out of there. And then I'll just fit a shiny new O-ring. I like to put a little smaller O-ring on here than the factory does. Every manufacturer has a different idea about how tight these bezels are supposed to be. I like mine quite loose so that they can be freely adjusted without messing up the setup of the indicator on your part. But you know, your mileage may vary. So then the number ring goes back on there under the needle and the number ring has a key on it that matches a key on the bezel so that as the bezel turns, it turns the number ring. There's kind of a bezel needle numbering sandwich there. So you gotta be careful to get that just right. That pushes on there quite easily. And that spins much more freely now. That's looking good. And while I'm at it, I'll clean some of the old crud off of the surface here with a razor blade. I have no idea what this is. 30 or 50 years of someone else's shop crud. I don't know. That's looking better. One final thing to check and that's, does the needle come back to the same place every time? Now, assuming the mechanism is moving freely and isn't sticky, it should come back to the same place. As you can see here, this one is not doing that. So if the mechanism is moving freely, but it's not returning to the same value, that means it's skipping teeth. So there's two possible causes for that. The backlash on the rack and pinion may be incorrect, as it was in my case, just needed a little bit of adjustment there. It was a little too loose, and so the pinion was slipping the occasional tooth on the rack, causing it to lose a position. So that's one possible cause. If you're not able to fix it by adjusting backlash, that means one of the other wheels in the mechanism is skipping. So either one of them is missing a tooth, which did not show up in my inspection, or the jewels might be worn. And once again, here we're into watchmaker territory. Those jewels can be replaced, but you need specialty tools and expertise to do that. So at that point, you're looking at sending the indicator off to an indicator restoration company. But mine's looking good after the backlash adjustment, so the back goes back on. And there we go, one Federal B-21 rescued from the eBay graveyard. There isn't any kind of calibration or anything that you need to do here. These are measuring relative travel, not absolute length. So as long as the gear wheels aren't slipping, there's really nothing that can go wrong here precision-wise. A real basic restoration like this is something that any home shop machinist can do, and it can save you a lot of money on buying fancy and expensive indicators such as this lovely tense resolution Federal. I hope this video gives you the confidence to dig into these indicators. Don't be afraid of them. If you can fix any basic machinery, you can probably fix one of these as well. And if you like these videos and you can swing it, throw me a little love there on Patreon. That's really what keeps my content going. I don't have corporate sponsors. It's all up to you guys and I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.